My name is Ryan Griggs. Uh, in the summer of 2013, I was an intern at the Mises Institute. How many have been to the Auburn campus? All right, so if you've been there, you've seen on the first floor Wolf Library, where every one of Murray Rothbard's own uh, private book collection, over 5,000 books, are stored. I had the distinct laborious privilege of putting them all there from where they were <laughs> in their storage boxes. I've also been a student of Mises University and an attendee at the Rothbard Graduate Seminar. This is, and I'm a, now a recurring attendee at these Mises circles. So, you know, Austrian economics is theoretical and philosophical, but the results of your time, your attention, your financial resources are not. Right? I am one of many products of the educational programs at the Mises Institute. I'm fully aware that that would not be possible without the support of people like yourselves. I would not be the man I am, nor do the work I do without you. So thank you. With that said, if you'll please join me in welcoming to the stage the president of the Mises Institute, Mr. Jeff Deist. Well, thanks very much for that, Ryan. He's uh, definitely been one of our, our great ambassadors out there. Uh, and if I can follow up a little bit and toot my own horn or toot the Mises Institute's horn, for people who haven't been there and, and visited us, we really encourage you to do so because a lot of people think of us as a think tank, an expression I don't like, or a website. We're certainly a website. We're one of the most traffic econ websites in the world. And we have un unbelievable amounts of books uh, available online for free. But we're really a lot more than that, and, and I'm sure many people in this room would agree that higher education and, and also K-8 education are in big, big trouble. So we strive to be an alternative school of sorts, a free school for, for people to come to and attend. And, and people who come to Auburn are actually quite surprised that we actually have a physical campus across the street from Auburn University. We have some very lovely gardens, some very lovely buildings. We own an apartment building where students stay, so we have uh, PhD candidates from around the world spend their summers with us doing research. Uh, undergraduate students come for a week in the summer to Mises University. It's actually a, a pretty exciting time, and they do all this for free. Uh, uh, we're actually one of the largest private libraries in the entire United States. We have over 50,000 physical volumes on our campus. So people are oftentimes surprised, and we would, we would invite any of you to visit us anytime and learn a little bit more about what we do. I think you're really going to enjoy the, the variety of our four great speakers today. They, they bring a variety of perspectives with them. Uh, libertarian, left progressive, populist, anti-war, anti-Fed, anti-communist, anti-Soviet. Uh, but all of them are pro-us in the sense that Lou Rockwell uses that term. Uh, that they are people who are interested in human flourishing and as a result are very concerned about what both the state and its central bank are doing to us, I would say, rather than for us. Uh, and I think one theme you'll find throughout all four speakers is, is emerging, and it's a populist theme. It's actually quite a non-ideological theme, and that's what's exciting to me is that we have an opportunity, I think, before us to build on some single-issue coalitions that transcend the R versus D dichotomy, the liberal versus conservative box that we've all been put into over the last many, many decades. And the two themes that really emerge is that outside of what they call the Acela Corridor, that's the train that travels between Washington, D.C. and New York City, outside of the Acela Corridor, meaning Washington and, and Wall Street, there is literally no constituency in America for what the Federal Reserve is doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what commercial banking looks like as a result. And outside of the Washington, D.C. Beltway, and we'll get to this, uh, those of you who are familiar with the area, some of these very tony towns like Great Falls, Virginia, and Potomac, Maryland, outside of the D.C. Beltway, there is literally no constituency in America for these endless Middle East wars in which we find ourselves engaged, uh, spending literally trillions of dollars and unknown amounts of, of injury and hardship, not only for American soldiers, but also for the people in those various countries. So when you think about that, it's pretty incredible. Democracy isn't yielding some sort of compromise down the middle where we, no, none of us get everything we want, but we get some of what we want. It's not working. It's creating an entrenched political class. 
in an entrenched economic class, but it's not giving us any kind of results uh, in, in terms of what the population actually supports. I, I, I'm very curious um, to see what, if Trump runs in 2020, and if he it continues to at least rhetorically engage in the, the act of questioning our involvement in the Middle East. He certainly backpedaled on that, and I think he did something very, very, very bad uh, by bringing Michael Bolton into the administration, but, we, but that remains to be seen. So what, what emerges today as, as a theme is cronyism. It's, it's interesting that there's a sense, an inescapable sense in the West, not just the United States, that, that something is very, very wrong. And we wonder why that might be. It's not materialist in the sense that if you read Deidre McCloskey or if you read Steven Pinker, you'll know that in a purely material sense, almost everyone's life in the West is getting better. And not even in the West, in the developing world, the number of people who live in severe poverty around the world continues to go down. And those of us who are fortunate enough to be born in the United States, uh, in, in terms of our material comfort, our tech, our modern medicine, in many ways, many material ways, life is getting better. And really, it, when we're talking about Western nations, it, but for the very poorest people, homeless people, I would, I would venture virtually everyone in this room wakes up every day and has some sort of habitation over their head, has hot and cold running water, has electricity, has a, an ample amount of food in the fridge, or the ability to go to go buy food at a restaurant. So in that sense, in the strictly material sense, we've probably never been better. So what is it? Why are people in the West so unhappy? And what is this foreboding sense we have? Is it economic in the sense that we're living on borrowed time? Is it political? Is it social? Is it cultural? It's probably all of these things, but I would say it's represented by our topic today, which is this unholy nexus this connection between state power and economic power. And it's something that's really rising in the United States. And we see it in, in so many contexts. Uh, we see it in the equities markets, a company like Amazon. This is not a startup, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a public company for more than 20 years. It still produces virtually no profit, and it doesn't pay any dividends. But somehow, magically, the stock price goes up year after year after year. And, and uh, from where I sit, a company uh, that never produces dividends, uh, that just counts on uh, capital gains accumulation, is, is a bit of a, a pyramid scheme. We see, certainly see it on Wall Street where the bonus uh, system and the incentives uh, since the 2008 crash have returned uh, with some degree of fervor. Uh, we see it in the equity markets, we see it in the real estate markets, in places like San Francisco and New York City, where young people struggle to find any place to live, even with roommates. We see this in Silicon Valley as well. And why, why should that be the case? Uh, we see it in the political world. And I don't mean to single out the Obamas. You may have noticed that they recently signed a $50 million deal with Netflix, which is going to keep them in, in, in very good shape financially for the rest of their lives. And uh, you know, contrast this with Harry Truman. When Harry Truman left office, he actually went home. He went to Independence, Missouri. And he was so broke, he was forced to live with his wife and his mother-in-law, <laughs> which seems like a bad end for a former president. His only income was a $113 a month army pension. And actually, uh, uh, not long after that, almost out of embarrassment for him, uh, Congress passed a uh, stipend for ex-presidents. It didn't exist until then. But again, I don't mean to single out the Obamas. Uh, the Reagans received quite a sweetheart deal. Uh, some friends of theirs purchased them a very nice home in Bel Air uh, for them to retire to. When Richard Nixon retired, uh, he retired to the White House West in San Clemente. And there was a, a very strange land deal that made that possible. And I noticed the other day that, that the White House West is back uh, up for sale on the market in San Clemente. It could be yours for, I think, $87 million. <laughs> so check it out. So the question becomes, what do we do about it? Uh, what should we do realistically uh, to fight what we see as this rising cronyism? And it does manifest itself in some ways in, in inequality, in the sense uh, that folks on the left are correct. There is some unearned wealth in the United States today. And that's an open question. Uh, when the young, brilliant tech kid comes up with a company idea, 
and some venture capitalists swoop in and buy it from him and he gets $30 million and he's a 22-year-old kid and he's got a Lamborghini. It, it's awfully hard, given what the Fed has done for the last 20 or 30 years, to really know how much value that kid created and whether it really was worth $30 million. So it, things get murky when so much of our economy seems to be rigged, either by fiscal policy in Washington or by monetary policy uh, at, at the Eccles Building in D.C.